I was always shocked by how, how there were no other foreigners in those parts of the city. No other foreigners really hanging out with the, with the Indonesians. All the, all the, there were quite a few foreigners, oil company people and, and people like, like my, my own team. We all hung out at these private clubs and the fancy restaurants, but didn't go, didn't hang out with the Indonesians very much. And I did, and I really, really enjoyed it. And they questioned me a lot, and they pointed out that Arnold Toynbee, the great British historian in 1954, had written a book called Civilization on Trial, which, which said that in the long run, the Muslim people are the biggest threat to capitalism, to, to the U.S. way. It, he, back in 54, he said it isn't communism. That's not ultimately a threat because it's not spiritual enough. It's not based in any real strong principles. For a culture to succeed, it has to be very principled. And he demised the fall of capitalism, what he called the West, because he said ultimately we, we, won't, we won't be that principled either and that, that the Islamic world would rise up because they have these strong beliefs in spirituality and they don't believe in us usury and they don't believe in lending money. And, and these young Muslims in Indonesia pointed that out to me and said, you know, you, you guys are in trouble. And this is back in the early 70s and they said, you know, the Muslim world is watching and we don't like what we're seeing. It was an amazing forewarning for, you know, if you, if you look at what's going on now in the world. The Muslims have become you know, very powerful and very, very angry at us. And it isn't simply about religion by any means. The Muslim religion at heart is not an angry religion. It's a compassionate re religion. Uh, but they're very angry because they see us as, as basically raping their world, pillaging it. And you know, they were always quoting statistics to me. We have a statistic that we throw around in this country a lot, that 5% of the world's population, us, the American population, consumes 25% of the world's resources. Now that really bothers most of the rest of the world that we're like this great octopus that, that would, reaches out with its tentacles and brings all the resources into us and look at the lives we lead, while three quarters of the world lives in destitution. Every day, 24,000 people die of starvation and 30,000 children die of curable diseases every single day. And the people who live in the places where that's happening are angry, angry. And they see us, 5% of the world's population, bringing in 25% of its resources, while so many of them live tragic, destitute, miserable, suffering lives. Ne needlessly suffering. It doesn't have to happen. And, but these... But the, uh, an even more important statistic, I believe, is that of that 5% of the world's population, only less than 1% controls more of America's resources than the 90% at the bottom. So, in fact, 25% of the world's resources are being funneled into this country essentially to serve 1% of 5% of the world's population terribly small. It's not even a pyramid. It's like a needle going up with a few very wealthy, very powerful people sitting on the top. It's created tremendous resentment around the world. It's what's created our insecurity. I, I would suggest that we will never be secure in this country, no matter how many guards we have at our airports, uh, until we decide that we're going to be a lot more compassionate with the world. And what, what a great thing that is to do. That will bring us the security that we need is when we start really opening ourselves up to the world and welcoming the world as brothers and sisters who we want to share the goodies with. And back in those days in Indonesia, these young Islamic people who, who, who I fell in love with and was working with um, saw all this. They anticipated it. And they warned me about it. And uh, it was a very telling experience for me, very moving. And yet, I was seduced. Sex, money, and power was coming my way, man. And I was going to take it. And I did. For too long. So what was your next assignment after that? What was the next big uh, project you were saddled with? Or country. Yeah, after that, I, I, I kind of began spreading out and, and hiring other people to work with me. So I, I did a lot of work in the next few years in Panama. And I also went back to Indonesia to, to do the same sort of thing we'd done in Java up on the island of Sulawesi and Colombia and Iran. So for, for three or four years, my time was very much split between those countries. And I would take other journeys into Egypt and 
and Guatemala and, and m many other places, and I, and, and I began hiring and hiring and hiring. I mean, I, I became very popular within Charles T. Maine because I was going along with the system, and the World Bank was loving what I was doing, and uh, um, I just kept expanding my department. I became a partner. I was making a lot of money and uh, for the company as well as for myself. So it, it involved quite a few countries. But, you know, the ones that had the greatest impression on me after Indonesia were, were Panama and Iran, and then Saudi Arabia. All right, I want to go into a little more detail on those, but first, you had spoken about how people on your team when you were in Indi Indonesia didn't have a grasp of the bigger picture of what was going on there. You were the, the single person that did. Once you started expanding your staff, were other people who were part of your staff, did they have the big picture? And then also, what about people at the World Bank and these other large organizations that you're kind of a front company for? Did they have the big picture? Mm. Great question, Mike. And, 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 and the question to, uh, the answer to both of those questions is essentially no. At, at the World Bank, the people, there were people that knew, and the people at the top certainly knew. But most of the people who were analyzing my reports and uh, did not, and, and, and in fact would try to punch holes in, in, in my forecast, I had to defend them very, very strongly, which I became very expert at doing and very good at doing. Uh, so these people were hired basically to pick apart the reports of consultants. But their bosses knew. They were, they were part of the system. They're always, in, in all of these organizations, there are a few people who are the economic hitmen who know what's going on, and the rest are pretty much kept in the dark, and, and they're doing their jobs, what they see as their jobs. But in the end, the economic hitmen went out because we all know. I mean, so if, if, you're, if you're a PhD economist who's, who, who's assigned to pick apart my study and punch holes in it if you can, you do that. I defend it strongly. Your boss is on my side, ultimately. He's an economic hitman, too. So in the end, I'm going to win. But there's going to be a song and a dance, so there's a great paper trail that shows that you really did your job. You tried to punch holes in me, but in the end, you, you became convinced that everything I was saying was, was true, was fact. And, and you get promoted, and you get a good bonus. Well, maybe at the Borough Bank it's a different set of bonus systems, but you, uh, you, know, you get the goodies too by going along ultimately. It was, as far as the people that I hired is concerned, and, and, and this became a very important part of my final decision to leave that world because I kept hiring young men and women um, to go out and do the same thing I was doing, but I never told them that they were doing it. They did not get the benefit that I get of a Claudine who trained them and said, this is what you're going to do and you're in for life. Instead, I told them what the results were that I wanted. If they went off to work in Saudi Arabia or, or Bolivia or wherever I sent them, I let them know that they better damn well come back with a really high forecast with the kind of numbers that I wanted to see. If they didn't, they wouldn't have a job. If they did, they would get promoted. They would get good Christmas bonuses. I mean, I controlled all that. And I also uh, was very manipulative in convincing them. I mean, and at the time, I was also publishing a lot of professional papers. I had a couple of very astute young people working for me. One, one was a PhD from MIT, uh, in, in, a mathematician. He, he got his PhD from MIT when he was 22 years old. He was a young man from India and brilliant and he put, he produced the kind of results I wanted we, we we wrote these papers so we had a whole system in place of convincing everybody that what they were doing was right and then rewarding them or get uh, the carrot and stick, stick approach that they got well rewarded when they did what I wanted and if they didn't do it they didn't get rewarded and they might get fired so they didn't have the same benefit that I did of, of being told this is what you're doing and in the end that made me feel very guilty that I'd manipulated people like that it was one of the reasons that I wanted to get out and one of the reasons that I wrote the book because that's typical throughout these organizations there are people doing that throughout the corporate world I know people who work for big corporations now that are outsourcing that have sweatshops in Asia producing the goods that they're selling in the United States paying people a dollar a day or less people who are working in terrible conditions and the men and women who are in charge of those operations out of out of places like Seattle and Portland and San Francisco and, and various other places, these men and women are going into these countries. They know, in their hearts, they know that what they're doing isn't right. But back home in the headquarters office is a whole 
team of psychologists, lawyers, and others telling them that what they're doing is fine, it's good, and that the people who are working in the sweatshops getting a dollar a day are better off than as if they didn't have